Uh, my name is Jane Thomas, and I happen to be president of Palos Verdes Women's Club, and I want to welcome all of you today. To, and this, can you believe, is our 56th annual Books and Authors Luncheon. So, <laughs> so that's, that's quite something. Um, the Palos Verdes Women's Club began in 1926, and it was actually a social organization at that time. And they met because this was a brand new community here on the peninsula, and they met to just get people acquainted, and they had dances and Sunday school classes and things like that. And over the years, from 1926, it has turned into a philanthropic group. So we have two fundraisers, this being one, and we have a garden tour in the spring. And the money that we earn goes to scholarships to local high schools and to um, chari local charities. We meet once a month here at Trump, and there is a brochure on your table that looks kind of like this. And we would welcome any of you as members if you might be interested in joining. There's a PO box number on there if you want to get in touch for a membership. And I want to thank the many, many people who have worked on this. Some of the ladies have worked very hard. And now I would like to introduce the chairman of this event, and that is Beverly Hill. Welcome. I think it's the 56th. How many of you were here 56 years ago? Oh. But almost, because I started coming years ago, and I realize what a wonderful event this was and the fun I've had. And it is just my pleasure to be up to work with the members who have been spectacular and all the guests that are here. Thanks so much. Uh, special thanks to Jane, President Extraordinaire. <laughs> my two cohorts, Sue Tyree and Terry Bowen. I don't know what I'd do without you. And then Mary Sobel, Sable. If it hadn't been for Mary Sable, we all wouldn't be here. She got all the authors together. And how lucky we are, because she's been doing this for two years, three years. Oh, you're marvelous. And she got to meet a lady, and her name is Terry Gilman. And she is the owner of the mysterious Galaxy Bookstore on Artesia, right? And boy, was she helpful. Absolutely. Thank you so much. OK. Our first speaker is Angie Ma Wong. Angie lived in New Zealand, Taiwan, Washington, DC, and that experience lit the spark of interest in the history of the Chinese of Los Angeles and motivated her to write Night of the Red Moon. The title is only one of two written about the Los Angeles Chinatown Massacre of 1871. It received a half-page review in the Los Angeles Times. The four-year saga of an abandoned pet alligator, and we all remember Reggie, in Harbor City Park Lake became Reggie the L.A. Gator and Reggie My Story, which became best-selling items at two local hospitals, believe it or not. An affinity to being an outsider at a new school as Barack Obama had experienced in Indonesia, resulted in Angie's two Mom's Choice Award winners, Meet President Obama, America's 44th President, and Barack Obama, History Maker. The author of 28 titles, including the four award winner, A Survivor's Secrets to Health and Happiness, Angie Ma Wong. Well, ladies, eat your heart out. I brought my own date, <laughs> Reggie. 
and my alligator purse. <laughs> well, you heard a little bit about my story. We lived in a very modest, uh, you know, being the daughter of a diplomat sounds good, but modest circumstances when you're in Wellington, New Zealand. I guess the stars were aligned when I was born in February, because it was Charles Dickens' birthday. But I was named after the city of Los Angeles when my mom and dad were stranded here after the war. Um, yeah, when we were living in New Zealand, at that time, uh, we didn't have a lot of money. But I was very blessed because we had enough of what was most important. And that was unlimited love, art supplies, and books. There were no iPads and computers and things like that at that time. And I'm so glad, otherwise I probably wouldn't have become an author. But dad was the one who instilled me with the love of learning, love of knowledge, and also of reading and writing. He always said, it was like the Chinese uh, proverb, knowledge is a treasure that no one can steal from you. Meanwhile, mom was struggling to make a lady out of a tomboy. I took, had to take ballet lessons, and all, I, all that resulted from that were muscular legs. Don't laugh, because when I went off to Virginia Tech, my, they were voted the best looking legs by the football team. <laughs> I used to roam the parklands uh, behind my house, climb into a tree and read up in the bushes up there. And that uh, went, stayed with me when we moved to Taiwan. And I got into, and I, when we got to Taiwan, I didn't speak any Chinese at all. I had to be tutored in Chinese and went to the American school. There I spoke with a British accent, didn't get along because most of the kids there were dependents of the uh, US military at that time. Got into my one and only fight in school. Sent to detention. And how many of you in here remember what standards were? I will not fight in class, I will not fight in class, and you write them over and over, okay. Well, this teacher decided to uh, have us each write a story. Well, I wrote a composition. It was about a boy who got into trouble at school. She read it, gave me a grade on it, and looked at me right in the eye and said, never stop writing. And so it changed my life. I didn't. I was writing poetry. I was writing short stories. I was writing plays. And so why do I went? My father was sent off and he, uh, to the United States, and we arrived here. And I grew up in Washington, D.C. during the 60s, during the Civil Rights Movement. I was manning the uh, staffing, the uh, phone at Woodrow Wilson High School when we got the news that uh, President Kennedy had been shot and grew up going to parties at the White House. So off it was to Virginia Tech to study architecture. Had math anxieties, had to change my major, folks. <laughs> English with a history minor. But I worked on the yearbook. I met somebody actually from the West Coast that when I was on the East Coast, got married, moved over here, and of course, and, um, because my parents were already um, Trojans, and I was marrying another Trojan, it was two generations of Trojans. My mother-in-law, class of 1930, yes, of course we're 33 alums, right? So, anyway, it was at USC, California History and Government. And uh, the professor was there. I was up in the uh, up in the uh, auditorium, and the professor stood there on the first day and said, "California has always been a racist state." I almost fell out of my chair, folks. I'd never heard about it. I didn't know anything about immigration, especially the Asians and the Chinese in, in America, but I learned fast. And it fascinated me that something that had happened in 1871 was so transforming of the city of Los Angeles. A massacre, can you imagine, that was sparked by an accidental shooting right in Los Angeles, Chinatown. 
Well, one thing led to another, and it was 1989, and I had my first uh, diagnosis of cancer at that time. And you know what? I thought life is too short, too precious. Uh, there are things I had not done in my life, so my bucket list included two things, having my own business and writing a book. Well, this is a firstborn child, overachiever, ended up writing 28 titles, right? 15 on feng shui, the Chinese environmental art of placement, and I made a business out of being a consultant to the builders. So you heard about how Reggie came about, and then, because I was the mother of four, I always wondered what happened to the socks, you know, when you did your laundry. <laughs> and so I wrote the poem, Who Ate My Socks? It languished in my computer for three years before I did something about it and wrote Who Ate My Socks. And then, because I was a history major, I love history, I guess that's the best kind of story I like, something. The research to me is like a treasure hunt, and after you amass all the information and everything, then you whittle it down and you get to write about it. So historical fiction is really my, fav my favorite. And so I have written several stories about that too. And then a friend of mine named Ed Beale one day called me up. <laughs> You probably all know Ed and Susie. He says, Angie, how would you like to be on the board of the Banning Museum? I says, what does it require? And he says, oh, four board meetings a year. I says, oh, yeah? OK, I can handle that. Well, one thing led to another, and soon I was decorating for Victorian Christmas and all that, you know, got really into it. And uh, this year, because it's the sesquicentennial of, uh, of the, the Banning Museum, I'm writing three children's books. One is about the first locomotive in Southern California. So any of you who uh, love trains, uh, that's coming out. Uh, and there will be a book signing at the, uh, the, at the Banning that first weekend in December. Well, guilt-free pleasures. For me, writing is whenever I can. I love what I write. And uh, you know, next to pistachio or black cherry ice cream, I always have a paperback in my purse, of course. I love to go out and talk to the young people, author visits at the schools. And you know what I tell them, folks? I'm still old school. Tell them, if people, because I talk to them about how an idea becomes a book. And I says, first you have to turn off anything that you have that is in your pocket or your purse or your bag that you charge. And you go out in the sunshine and you charge yourself up with, the, with sunshine through nature and get back in there. You have to have quiet. You have to be quiet. Because without quiet, you can't think. And you can't dream. And you can't imagine. And then you can't create. So turn it all off and let your mind grow with it. And get out there. So that goes for every one of you two in this room. How many of you have ever wanted to write a book? Thought about it? Come on now, don't be shy. All right. Everyone has a book in them. Did you know that? Yes. Now everyone has a story to tell. Every single one of you has a story to tell. You need to write what you know. Write about yourself first. It's so important. Why? Because you are your family's historian. Every one of you in here, don't just leave your children and grandchildren or your friends money and memories. Write your story. When we are gone, our history is gone. So write the book, make the stories, Make the, the stories and share them. Your life is interesting, so write about that too. And just one thing for the holiday, since we're ready for it, okay. Take this advice from a 24-year cancer survivor. The holidays are coming. Life is short, unpredictable, and so precious. Eat your dessert first.
Our next author is Dana Precious. She lives in Los Angeles with her husband and son, two dogs, a small border terrier named Thompson, as in Hunter, long story, and Bella, a very large mastiff, whose activity of choice is sleeping on the couch and watching Oprah. Prior to writing, Dana worked for several major film studios. She is currently a principal, principal slash creative director at the entertainment advertising agency Vox and Associates. Previously, she worked for nine years at Sony Pictures Theatrical as the executive vice president of creative advertising. She was responsible for the advertising of films such as Spider-Man, Charlie's Angels, Black Hawk Down, Stuart Little, and dozens more. Dana Precious. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the Palos Verdes Women's Club for having me here today. I really appreciate it, and it's a really wonderful event. Um, my name really is Dana Precious. That's usually the first question I get. No, I would not have changed my name to Precious. That would not have been my choice. Uh, I come from a long line of Preciouses. Um, as my name might indicate, I have had the blessing and the curse of leading a roller coaster life of very unlikely events. And the story of Born Under a Lucky Moon, my book, is largely an autobiography. It's about my family. And it was written as a memoir, but my publisher said, uh, Dana, nobody will ever believe that such crazy, wacky things would ever happen to one single family. So they listed it as fiction <laughs> instead. Um, but when you read it, it's, that's my family. Um, and just to prove that kind of crazy things happen in my life, in my family, I, right before uh, I got up here, I went outside to look at my notes and yes, to have a cigarette. And um, a man approached me who looked strangely familiar. And I looked up, who happens to be my high school friend from Michigan. I said, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, well, I live here now and I saw I saw you know, this advertised, and I saw your name, so I thought I'd come by and say hi. And Doug's here somewhere. Doug, where are you? There he is, that's Doug. Okay, now Doug, the reason I bring it up is Doug happens to be a character in my book. <laughs> and I have not seen or heard from Doug in about 15 years. So that's the kind of thing that tends to happen in my life. Um, so I'm as surprised as anybody else. Um, my book is about a series of events that occurred in my family over a short period of time. Um, I'm the youngest of five kids, and if any of you have a family, you, can, you know that they can be a tremendous pain in the ass. Um, they can also be incredibly warm and loving, and there for you when you need them. Um, I also grew up in a very small town in Michigan called Muskegon, which Doug grew up there too, uh, which is where the book takes place. And really what it's about, my brother was getting married on a Saturday and my mom thought it would be a brilliant idea to throw one of my sisters a surprise wedding the very next day without telling my sister. I was the maid of honor. I really was. Um, it was definitely a surprise to my sister and the guy uh, that she got married to. But they went through with it um, because that's my sister didn't want to embarrass my mom, so that's what it came down to. The events eventually unfolded um, to end, and I know this, it's a comedy, I write comedically, but it ended with a murder and with a sex scandal involving the older women in our town and our family minister. So this was all within a very short period of time. Um, I think that if any one of my siblings had, had written about these events, I think they would have written it, some of them I think would have written it as a tragedy. Um, certainly the sister that got married off. Um, but, I saw, but I saw everything ever since I was a kid as a comedy. And I don't know if it's a defense mechanism or something else, but um, that's the way I write. I just wanted people to feel good. And that's the way I saw life. And 
As I say in the book, when it comes to family, the events do not reside in the black and white of right and wrong. They reside in the gray area called love. That's it. Thank you. Our next author is Jenny Nash. She's the author of four novels, including Perfect Red, The Threadbare Heart, The Only True Genius in the Family, and The Last Beach Bungalow. She is the author of three memoirs, including, now get this, Victoria's Secret Catalog Never Stops Coming. Don't you like that? You had that happen? Yeah. She's written a wide range of publications, uh, including the New York Times, the Huffington Post, Ladies Home Journal, and GQ, and has been an instructor at the UCLA Extension Writing Program for six years. Jenny runs a consulting business that offers editing, coaching, and strategic guidance to fiction and nonfiction book writers. She lives in Torrance with her husband and her two daughters, Jenny Nash. So Dana just provided the perfect segue to me because I, I do in fact teach um, memoir at UCLA and, and I run this business helping other writers write their books and all day long for years and years and years people come to me with the craziest stories just like she's describing. And, and when you are in the position that I am of, of receiving these stories all day long, I'm not surprised by anything anymore. I mean, people will call me and they'll say, I want to write a book about um, my wife left me for another woman. And I think, oh yeah, okay. And someone else will come and say, uh, my mother was murdered, I want to write a book about that. I mean, it's just, it all seems very commonplace to me. Um, someone will come and say, I want to write a book about cheese. <laughs> like, well, of course, cheese and murder and, and uh, ends of marriage all fit together somehow uh, really nicely. But the point of, of that is everybody does, in fact, have a story in them. And as Maya Angelou said, there's no greater burden than bearing an untold story inside you. So my job is to help people get that story out. So it comes to pass that all writers of every stripe I feel like I'm about to fall through the, the stage here. So if that happens, it's, it's, really, it's really unstable. Don't laugh if that happens. So um, the thing with writers, all writers, is that they are full of doubt. And they, no matter who they are, they might be a CEO of a company, they might be a famous actress, they might be very successful in their regular life, but when they come to write their story, they're a basket case all the time. And they ha are full of doubt about, do I really have something to say? Is this really worth say saying? Am I saying it right? Will anybody care? So after years and years of hearing all these complaints from people and helping them through them, it's, it's a lot more like therapy than it, it that is like writing, I got this idea stuck in my head about a writer who couldn't get the idea out of her head. And that's what my book Perfect Red is about. I designed this story to make the worst possible circumstances for this girl and her story. Um, I became haunted with her, and she's haunted with the story, so it's, um, it's kind of a nice uh, double, double thread there. But the story she's haunted with is a story about a lipstick, a red lipstick, which is why I'm wearing red today. And um, the red lipstick has this myth behind it that people say that this lipstick, if, if a girl wears it, and I say girl because it was in the 50s and they used that, that term, um, if she wears it, she can attract any man she wants. It will give her ultimate power, this perfect red lipstick. And so she's terrified of this lipstick, she's attracted to this lipstick, and she wants to write a story about this lipstick, but she's too chicken to put it on. And I set up all these roadblocks for her, um, the, the worst of which is that she gives her story away to a man, which is a very 50s thing to do, because he needed a story more than she needed a story. And she gave it away, and she had to fight for it uh, to get her story back. Well, 
I decided to set the, the story in the 50s because, as we all know, that was a time when speaking the truth was a very big deal. And it was difficult to speak the truth. It was frowned upon to speak the truth. And so to get her story back, she not only has to confront her own doubts, she has to confront this guy that she gave the story to, and she has to confront a whole society that doesn't want her to speak and doesn't want her to write and doesn't want her to be this voice that she needs to be. So it's a story of her uh, struggle, and it's ultimately a story of her triumph. And in the end, she wears the lipstick, so it's awesome. <laughs> uh, I'll be out there signing afterwards, and I will look forward to seeing you all out there. And if anybody has a book that they need to write, I'm your gal. Nothing will shock me. <laughs> and this lady is Bridget Binns. She's a native Californian and is called many places home, Oregon, New York City, London, southern Spain, and Los Angeles and upstate New York. She is overjoyed to be setting down her firm roots in the center of her home state, California, and plans finally to circle the wagons. Bridget now lives and writes and teaches in Paso Robles, along with her husband, actor Casey Biggs. And I was confused because she's B-I-N-N-S, her husband is B-I-G-G-S. I, I didn't make that mistake. And he's known virally as the Paseo Wine Man. <laughs> this is her 26th cookbook. Hi. Hi. My name is Bridget, and I'm a carnivore. I also like vegetables and fruits and chicken and seafood and fish, and I basically love food. I like bright food. I like sunny food. I grew up here. I feel like California is, my, is in my blood, and it, it actually is in my blood. My grandmother was the couture buyer for Bullock's Wilshire downtown. Um, and my godfather was Uncle Pat, Pat Brown. So um, how crazy was it for me to move away from here over and over and over and over again? And there was always a reason. It was usually a man. <laughs> And at the time seemed like a, a, a good reason. Portland, Oregon, um, I went on, remember uh, those outward bound things where you would go, anyone here, out in the middle of nowhere for three days with a tarp and some granola? <laughs> and that was supposed to build character, right? So I would write my mother, who was in Brentwood for 40 years, about her lamb stew, the, her amazing lamb stew. And so it, start, it started to sort of gain traction that I was going to be involved with food. But first, I majored in Chinese studies at Lewis and Clark College, because there was a guy from high school that was going there. So, um, <laughs> And then I couldn't get a job doing that. I went to China for a while. I went to Taiwan for a while. I ate the most amazing things. Couldn't get a job, so I ended up working for Morgan Stanley in New York. I don't really know how that happened. Um, and then somehow I married the Eurobond trader for Morgan Stanley from the London office and went to live in London. And he said, you don't have to work anymore. What do you want to do? I was like, well, wait, that doesn't happen. Um, I want to go to cooking school. I've always wanted to learn how to really cook well. And he said, OK, you can do that. So I went to cooking school. And on the first day, we made lemon meringue pie and steak and kidney pudding. This is London, in case I didn't mention that. Um, and I said, you know, I'm going to quit. This is not what I can. No, no, we're going to move on. So then we moved on to the mother sauces, the French, the daughter sauces, whatever, all that kind of stuff. Didn't do much with it. And my husband sort of had one of those meltdowns that people in the financial world do. And we had to go live in southern Spain very, very quickly. <laughs> and someone needed to earn some money. So I started catering. 
And it was mostly a British community there, so uh, they would say, well, aren't we going to have sausage rolls? <laughs> and I'd say, no, we're going to have, I was really into Martha Stewart at the time, I said, we're going to have um, little skewers of artichoke hearts and lamb on the grill. And they'd be like, well, I don't know what that is. <laughs> so I did that for three years, and that was very uh, successful for me, because after seven years in London, and the rain and the white food, to, to be in Spain with the sunny flavors, the sunny colors, and also to be earning a living, for me, it was like I blossomed. The other half of my family did not blossom, and he is still there. Um, <laughs> he was wanted by several fraud squads um, <laughs> for a while, but I think he's doing better now. And, and so I came to Los Angeles, finally back to my home state in 92, and I had an idea that I might like to write a cookbook. All, up until that time, all I had done is love reading other people's cookbooks, and it was really a sort of an impossible dream. But I met some women, Ellen Rose, who had the Cook's Library down on 3rd Street, and she said, you know what? someone needs to write a book about polenta because polenta is very hip and there's no book yet. So I wrote a proposal, she told me who to send it to, and that was my first cookbook. And this is number 26. So I guess it turned out okay. <laughs> but then I kept moving away from California and the end of my story is that I'm back and I will never go anywhere else ever again. The Central Coast reminds me of what Santa Barbara was like when I was a kid, and it is so beautiful and so dusty and raw and full of great food and great people and great wine. Um, I encourage you guys all to come up there and visit, and thank you so much for having me down here. What a, what a great gang, by the way. I mean, can we say that? Everyone that I've talked to that's come up has been so interesting and wonderful. Thank you. Okay. This author is Tammy Kaler. Her career in marketing and technical writing landed her in the world of automobile racing, which inspired her with its blend of drama, competition, and welcoming people. Her debut, Dead Man's Switch, was praised by mystery fans as well as racing insiders. And she takes readers back behind the wheel in Breaking Points, the second Kate Riley racing mystery. Tammy works as a technical writer in the Los Angeles area where she lives with her husband and many cars. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, what a great looking crowd. Um, so I write mysteries about a female race car driver. And what's kind of funny is that almost every word in that sentence is a mistake. Um, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I've, I've made a career as a writer, technical writer, marketing, business communications, speech writing, ghost writing, journal articles, whatever, you name it. I'd have said to you 10 years ago, I can write anything you need. Show me a sample except for fiction. I can't write fiction. Well, and then one day I had an idea. I woke up with a scene in my head that wouldn't go away. Um, I had always been a reader, always of fiction. I mean, I'm sure there are many of you in this room for who this is true. Reading is my sanity. It's, if I have a drug, it's reading. Um, but I, I hadn't really ever turned that around and externalized that until this day I woke up with an idea in my head that wouldn't go away. And I finally had to write it down. And even as I was doing it, I thought, this is weird. And I looked around and I found, I was living in Northern California at the time, and I found a great class at a local bookstore called Do You Have a Book in You? I thought, well, that's the question. <laughs> so I went to this class, it started going, and the funny thing, I kid you not, this really happened to me, the first session of this, you know, one evening a week, four week class, I'm halfway through the class, and I thought, oh my God, she's going to make me write. <laughs> Like, what did I expect from this class, right? So anyway, I wrote, I kept writing, I went into the next class, which was you can finish this book. I rolled into the writing group she was doing. And about a year and a half later, I had finished the manuscript. Now, it's terrible, okay? But the point was I had finished it and I had learned. Um, about that time, 
I was working for a, uh, a subprime mortgage lending company that, well, it'll go nameless because it doesn't exist anymore, let's just say. But they had gotten involved in racing. I was working in marketing, and they had gotten involved in racing because they were spending money like water. And uh, they needed help going along to races to entertain their customers. And I went, well, I'm always curious to learn about new things. I'll go with you. And I showed up to a series of races, a professional racing series, big dollars, Porsches, Ferraris, Maseratis, Audi, you know, all these big, big name manufacturers competing. And I showed up as a representative of a series sponsor. And if you don't know what that means, it means that I had access to everyone. So I went from knowing absolutely nothing about the racing world to being just, my mind was blown because I'm put in a Porsche 911 for a hot lap around a track in the hands of a professional race car driver. And I'm meeting all of these people and, and seeing the teams and talking to the mechanics. And I learned about this from the inside out. And I thought, this is so amazing. There's drama, there's competition, there's passion, there's this violence, and everyone is really friendly. And they're like a family. And the contradictions there just blew my mind. Um, and so I had an idea. I had an idea to write a mystery because I had especially always loved Dick Francis. So I, I happened to have a conversation that weekend with a published mystery author, author the great Hallie Efren, one of the Efren sisters. And I said, I have this great idea. And she said, that's wonderful. Who's your protagonist? And I said, well, she's a marketing person in the series. And she went, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> no, she's got to be the race car driver. Now, of course, I knew what that meant was that this chicken behind the wheel had to get behind the wheel and understand that. And, and, and I did, and that's another story. Um, but that set me on the path. Now, in looking back, I realized that though all of those happenings were sort of accidental, I mean, I didn't plan for them. I didn't you know, plan to stand up here and be able to say, I write racing mysteries. Um, but Looking back, you know how you can look back on a decision and say, oh, well, that was obvious, but it took me six months to figure out the right course. There are obvious reasons for it. I've always been a sucker for stories of personal achievement. I don't know about you, but the Olympics roll around and I'm like in tears for two weeks because, you know, so-and-so is achieving their personal best and, you know, Eddie the Eagle's just out there competing and, you know, whoever it is or great performances. And I have even been known, I don't actually admit this, I'll admit it to you, but I don't know you all, and I, I don't really admit it to close people, because they'd make more fun of me, but I have been known to make myself cry writing the scenes where my race car driver actually does something personally compelling. <laughs> Dork. I mean, I cry at Hallmark commercials, so, you know, whatever. Um, but I, I have also always loved mysteries, especially those that teach you something. So I don't know if any of you have ever read the, the Cleo Coyle Coffee House Mysteries, which is kind of a mouthful, but they're set in a coffee house and they're all about how wonderful, you know, the different beans are and the roasting and the desserts you pair of them. I hated coffee. And I still loved those books and I would find myself thinking, I got it. No, you hate coffee. You're not, this is not going to work for you. But they were still so compelling. I like learning that way through fiction where there's also a puzzle. I also have always loved mysteries because everything turns out all right in the end. You know, I mean, the world can be a little grim, right? I mean, turn on the news, I, I pick up mysteries for relief because even if, even if the bad guy doesn't always go to jail, you know the reason for the bad thing that happened by the end of the book. And that's what I find reassuring, I think. I've also always had an affinity for stories of women achieving in atypical arenas. And one of the most interesting things I found when I got involved in the racing world was that, you know, we all, we all see pictures of racing, even if you don't follow racing, I'm sure you've seen pictures of racing, and you see all these beautiful women, the Pirelli girls and the Trophy girls and, you know, the, the Spandex girls, right? And they're gorgeous, and they're probably, many of them, very intelligent, but they are not there for their intellectual abilities. They're there for their appearance. But what happened was I got involved in the racing world, and I met women who were there for their brains and for their physical abilities. And I, I now count as friends um, Porsche racing instructors and women who are safety car drivers. You know, when there's an accident and they, they pull all the cars behind, they have a caution and they, there's a pace car that's out there. I, my friends drive those cars. And a friend who's an engineer on the pit box during the race analyzing the data. So I met these women um, who, who were part of the world. In, in fundamental ways and contributing to the world, you know, in a man's world. And I was really intrigued by that kind of role. And so I, I thought of you know, a woman driver. Um, and, and finally, I wrote the book that I wanted to read, um, where an individual achieves personal triumph, where a woman gets ahead, and where the reader learns something from the inside. Fundamentally, I was so astounded by this world that I had learned from the inside out, I wanted to share that with everyone else. 
So what that got me was um, a story, stories about Kate Riley. I'm writing a, a mystery series. Kate Riley is a young race car driver whose life would be a whole lot simpler if all she had to do was drive her team's Corvette. These being mysteries, that is rarely the case. Um, in the first Kate Riley racing mystery, Dead Man's Switch, Kate is looking for her first full-time job in sort of the big league racing when she literally bumps in, and I use literally honestly, you know, uh, she literally bumps into a dead driver at the start of one race weekend. Um, and she takes his job, of course, but discovers that not only, along with preparing to race the new car, she also needs to clear her name to be taken seriously by the rest of the racing world. In the second book, Breaking Points, which we have here today, we come across Kate a little more than a year later, racing the same car in the same series. She's doing well with her new team until one really terrible, bad day when she wrecks her own car, sends racing's favorite driver to the hospital, uh, loses her cool at a, at a belligerent fan on camera, and then finds a friend dead that night. So it's a pretty bad day. So after all that, in one day, she's suddenly the pariah of racing, and she's, she's the target of hate mail and death threats and attacks from frenzied bloggers. But the worst part is knowing that her friend's killer is still out there and also still aiming at Kate. Um, I'm working on the third book now. It's going to be set at the 24 Hours of Daytona Endurance Race, and that's really true. The cars, run, cars and teams run for 24 hours. The drivers get a little sleep. But of course, Kate's not going to be able to sleep much because she's going to be having to solve a murder or two, along with driving the car in the, the dark and the wind and the fog and the rain and all kinds of things. So thank you for having me here today. I'd love to tell anyone other stories if you're interested. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Last but not least, and Mary has said, wait till you get to meet T. Jefferson Parker. And that's whom you're going to meet right now. He's the author of 20 crime novels, including Silent Joe and California Girl, both of which won the Edgar Award. And you know that's pretty good for being best mystery. His last six books are a border sextet featuring ATF task force, for, excuse me, task force agent Charlie Hood as he tries to staunch the flow of illegal firearms being smuggled from the U.S. into Mexico. He enjoys fishing and biking and cycling and went to the uh, University of California at Irvine, majored in English, and as those of you who know, that is an awfully good creative writing school, so he had those advantages. And um, he has so many accolades from the media, just pick up Google sometime, and you will get to know more about T. Jefferson Parker. Thank you. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, and uh, thank all of you for being here. Um, nothing really better for a writer than a room full of, you know, 300 literate readers. So I'm, I'm happy, plus a good lunch and great company. I love the other writers and what they said. Um, very, I can relate to all of it, obviously. Um, is, this, is this loud enough in the back there? Okay, good. Um, so thank you, and 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 congratulations on the you know the charities that you support raising the money. Good, good. Uh, Mary filled me in on that um, earlier. The uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, they seem to be curious more about me than my writing sometimes. What made you become a writer? Why do you do this? You know, you're old enough to know better, or whatever it might be. And um, so I, I I've thought about that a lot, and and there there. Like a lot of you, I think there were three there were three things that happened in my life, really pretty young, that, that sort of forced me into doing what I'm doing. I think that circumstances impose themselves on us sometimes more than the other way around. And um, so these are my these, this is why I'm a writer. I'm going to tell you, and then I'll tell you about the new book a little bit. Um, I had three major literary experiences in my life. The first one was when when I was so young that I can't remember it. I was an infant in the crib. And I was a firstborn child, and um, I was often inconsolable. Uh, yet I was happy, and I was I was or I was well fed, and I was warm, and I was healthy. There was no problems, but I made a lot of noise. I was always setting up a racket, which drove my mom crazy because she was a reader. She was always reading something. That was her drug. 
Um, and um, so one day she just got so sick of me caterwauling in the crib. Um, she had the book that she was trying to read and she started reading it out loud in a very forceful voice so that she could drown me out. And she started reading and lo and behold, within just a few seconds, I, I, I was quiet and my eyes uncrossed and I, and I listened and I listened and I listened and I loved the story that she was reading so much. Um, and it would work most of the time. If I was ever inconsolable in the crib, mom would whip out a book. Uh, my favorite book, uh, T. Jefferson Parker's Thumbs Up in 1953, the year I was born, was Marjorie Morningstar about the hot nurse. Remember that one? <laughs> I love that book and uh, still do. <laughs> so there's, there's an experience, a literary experience, where I'm listening to words and a story that I have no idea what they mean. It's the tone of my mother's voice probably and nothing more that got me got me uh, hypnotized. So, you know, fast forward a few years, um, old enough to understand a story and language, um, but not old enough to read, like, you know, say, two, three, four. Um, I remember sitting on mom's lap and being read to. Mom was a big reader, and she kept reading to me all the time. She'd read, read, read. And of course, when you get your own books when you're a kid, they're always about animals. So I had Vulcan the Condor, I had Perry the Squirrel, I had Bambi, we had my very, very favorite, still my favorite children's book of all time, Shag, Last of the Plains Buffalo. And, and, when mom, and when mom would finish reading one, I'd just go, again? Uh, like a madman, over and over and over. I wanted to hear the story again and again and again. So a few years later, um, I go into high school as a, a, a literate young man in the sense that I appreciate a good story because I've heard so many of them, you know? Wasn't a bookish kid particularly in high school. I was just, I took just basic, you know, basic classes. And uh, I, I decided one uh, semester of my sophomore year to take a class for an easy A. I generally chose my classes for easy A's. And I, I saw mythology and folklore. I thought. <laughs> Come on. I mean, this is going to be an easy A, you know? So I enroll in Miss Page's uh, you know, mythology and folklore class. And Miss Page is a, is a lovely, young, bright, dedicated teacher who is going to teach us mythology and folklore. Well, we are like regular guys. It was mostly boys. I don't know why. Just wanted the easy A, and we were disrespectful. We were, we were a horrible class. And halfway through the semester, I remember it was a rainy day, went into Miss Page's class, and she just glowered at all of us, and she said, you know, I'm not going to try to teach this class today. I think you're, you're utterly incapable of learning. So what I'm going to have you do is form a single file line at my desk and come up. And when it's your turn, when you close your eyes and reach into this box, pasteboard box full of paperbacks I brought from my garage, and take it back to your seat in absolute silence and read it. And if there's so much of a peep out of you, I'll send you to Mr. Andrews. He was a guy with the club. And so, so when it was my turn, I got up to the, her desk and I closed my eyes and I reached into the box and I pulled out a tattered old copy of Joseph Heller's Catch-22. Yeah, and I thought, well, I, don't, I barely knew which way to hold it. I go, okay, Joseph Heller, never heard of him. And I took it back to my desk and I started reading it and I started giggling. <laughs> Why? Because it's funny. And then I took it home and I read it every spare moment I got. I'm a slow reader. It took me a couple weeks to finish that book. But I thought that book was so, it was, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was better than Shag Last of the Plains Buffalo. It's about, it's about people, you know? And uh, I, when I finished that book, finished that book, I remember walking around the, the hallways there and Tustin High as a sophomore. I must have been, what, 15? And I remember thinking to myself, you know, it'd be really cool to be a writer when you grow up. And if you are a writer and you grow up, if you could ever give your readers one one millionth of the pleasure that you got from Joseph Heller's Catch-22, you could consider yourself a success based on how much that book affected me. And so I think in some teenage, 15-year-old's kind of way, I'm still trying to hold up my end of that bargain. Um, I've written 20 books, and I'm trying to get you guys to enjoy them one one thousandth of the amount that I enjoyed Joseph Heller and m many, many other books um, since then. So that's kind of like three moments that guided me. I became an English major at the University of uh, Irvine, and I started writing. I got a newspaper job as soon as I got out and started writing, and I wrote I wrote, and I've been, that's all I've been, that's all I do. That's all I've ever been doing since college. And I've been published now uh, 28 years, uh, um, 20 novels, another one all set for next year. I kind of fell into the mystery thriller, kind of crime writing genre 
halfway by accident and half because I liked reading the old hard-boiled guys, Raymond Chandler and, 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 the, and those. And, and I kind of fell into that genre because it was popular and easy to get along in. And I've been doing that pretty much ever since. So another one of those things where circumstances kind of guide you rather than you uh, really kind of knowing what you're doing. So anyway, um, 20 novels now, all crime, mystery novels, all set in Southern California. Um, they're, they're pretty much all standalone novels, which means they don't really interrelate closely, except for the last six, which constitute the Charlie Hood series that um, she, she mentioned. And uh, Charlie is, a, is a, a, a good young man, an earnest fellow, a straight cop, but not a zealous uh, cop. And he's a, he, he's a guy who enters a very, very dark and mysterious and, 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 and wicked world. He, it, Charlie, over the course of the six books, finds himself deeper and deeper into the Mexican drug cartels in his, in his work, which is to prevent firearms from going south to help arm those cartels. And uh, the series opens, Charlie's kind of a hapless you know, deputy cruising, the, cruising LA County in, his, in his, his car in his little uniform. And by the end of the sixth book, he's this, he's this kind of half-crazed guy who has given it his best to, to go up against the very worst people the worst criminals in the world and see if he could prevail. Um, I've always been interested in, in, in the dark and the light. Uh, what is a hero against evil? Um, uh, where do, you know, what, what, what constitutes honorable behavior, you know, uh, for a hero and for a man or a woman? Um, I like sort of the serious stuff. It's, it's, it's all kind of Old Testament stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's serious. It's kind of it's spooky. Um, there's a lot of evil and there's a lot of good. And I like those two powerful forces clashing. So the books are not light. They're grown-ups books, and they're. Um, I hope. I, I hope you know when all is said and done, X years from now, when I'm long dead and gone, that people will be able to pick up my books and get sort of a feel for what it was like to be in the here and now. I, I try to be, you know, realistic uh, uh, as much as I can. So I hope the, I hope my books reflect some truth, some bigger truths that you all can relate to and enjoy. And uh, you know, number one, and finally, I've always seen myself primarily as an entertainer. I think it's my job. So um, I hope that the books entertain you, and, and, and I think that they will if you give yourself over to them and, and, and sort of let yourself be drawn into that world. I think that you will be well rewarded and entertained. And, and um, when you put it down, you might have a little bit to think about. So thank you for having me, and God bless. Okay, this is me saying goodbye. And just to remind you that the authors will be out there to talk with you and sign their books. So make sure you go out there. Thank you all for being here. Bye.